Welcome to the Green Living Chats brought to you by Ecoamet Solutions Ghana. I'm your host, David. There is a saying, when the last tree dies, the last man also dies. This is a very common saying among the African community, mainly throwing a lot of emphasis on how human values the tree. Well, today we are not just talking about the trees, but biodiversity. If you don't know what this is, check out our last episode with Gideon Dame Jawa, an ecologist with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, who took some time off to discuss with us what biodiversity means and how human actions are influencing it. Today, we specifically dive into climate change and how it is a threat to biodiversity. We also discuss details why we should do everything to protect our biodiversity and why you, somewhere in a village, in a city, or wherever you find yourself, should be concerned about human impact on biodiversity. Here we go. Okay, so I'm um, I'm still here with Gideon, and we are gonna dive into climate change and its impact on biodiversity. So let's talk about we have talked about some of the human activities that are impacting biodiversity, and we have discussed this. It's been an interesting uh, discussion. I just want us to specifically dive into climate change as an ecologist. How would you define climate change? And then what impact do you think? It's, I think it's a very broad question. So let's take it one by one. I know that naturally, biodiversity has its own way of uh, responding to environmental changes. But then now we all know about this extreme changes that are happening over time. And that's what we call climate change, which is practically based on human activities. When these extreme changes happen, how does it affect biodiversity? Yeah, uh, uh, you know, I love giving short answers before diving into the discussion. Okay. Now, to answer your question straight, climate change is the change in weather condition over a very long period. Unlike the weather, the weather change is, can be hourly, daily. But when we talk about climate change, we are talking about hundreds of years, thousands of years, millions of years. Now, when you have a change in the weather condition over a very long period of time, we tag that as climate change. However, you made a point that is still a hot topic of debate. Before now, the equation used to be climate change and biodiversity, but in the last, uh, let's say 50 years, and then recently, just not uh, just a decade ago, we've come to include the third variable in the equation. That's the anthropogenic. That's the anthropogenic effect. But there's still an argument whether we have it is human activities that is driving climate change, or it is climate change that is driving human activities. <laughs> but no matter the position that any person would take in the argument, the truth of the fact is that there has been climate change over time. But with the introduction of human activities into the equation, the climate change has skyrocketed. Let me mm. give you a, let me give you the historical background. Now, Apologies to people who hold religion. But in science, we believe that man evolved and was not created. And the evolution of man is just close to 5 million or there about years. But we've had climate changing over 100 million years ago. However, the change have been very gradual. And the changes were as a result of the eclipse where we have the sun, the moon, we have diverse regions 
or in the earth system. So the sun, the level of sunlight in different regions varies. So that created the climate change. But with the introduction of human into the equation, in the last 100 years, that's from 1800 till 2020, we have experienced 1% average increase in temperature. That is the ICPC's report. However, there are arguments that we've even exceeded that one, that ICPC just selected some papers that didn't capture all. Because I can tell that the northern part of Russia uh, they have experienced 4 to 8% increase already in the climate change. Now, people might just think ah, one, one, degree, one degree change is, is, is nothing. 0 0.1 degree change in climate change has a great impact in the physiology of animals and plants. Now, this I'm going to be revealing very quickly. So the coming in of man into the equation have increased the level of temperature that we experience. A recent study that was published in uh, nature, nature communication in 2017 showed that in 2016, we had the hottest April, month of April in the last 100 years, where we had 0 0.1 average degrees, but as of 2016 April, the temperature had increased to up to 0 0.8. Now, last year, based on ICPC's report, last year, September was the hottest September in the lifetime of man. What is it trying to show? That there is a trend in increase. And climate change became very, very, very pronounced five million years ago, coinciding with the evolution of man. So that is, and what are some of the things that man does that makes the climate to change? One, the agricultural practices that we do. And the agricultural practices, we are just talking about the land use change where you have people converting forests to land, farmlands. You go, you cut down the forest because there is increase in the population. So mo more land is needed to be cultivated. You cut down the forest. Deforestation, of course. And then, yes, you have the land to till, but you have actually reduced the plants that will take in carbon dioxide when emitted. Because the same us that cut down trees, the same us we use vehicles that emit carbon dioxide. So we are overburdening the carbon that the, the, the atmosphere with carbon dioxide with lesser plants to absorb the carbon dioxide. Now, aside that, when we go to farm, we use our fertilizers. The nitro, the, the nitrous oxide. It's one of the greenhouse gases that causes climate change. So with this, you might be right to say human activities is driving climate change. And so now that is the discourse around climate change. Now to answer your question about biodiversity, how biodiversity is affected. Biodiversity is affected greatly when there's a slight change in the temperature or precipitation. How? Physiologically, the biodiversity is burdened, whereby you have the metabolism of either the plant or the animal rising. And so you are increasing the cost of the physiological cost of this animal to maintain its, its metabolism. That means the animal will have to 
work less and rest more to balance up the physiology. In the case of uh, life bearing animals, that's those that are pregnant. Mm -hmm. Studies have shown that when they are pregnant, they reduce their level of exposure to hot temperature because it affects not only them, but even the fetus that they are carrying. So we are increasing what we call the cost of production, reproduction for these organisms. And when we are increasing the cost of reproduction, it comes with what we now call trade-offs. That is, animals have to forego some certain things to maintain some certain things. For instance, yeah. you see an animal physiologically reducing the number of offspring that she would have given birth to invest in a few. Instead of giving birth to 10, that animal, especially in raptors, will go to give birth to three and invest more for the offspring to be able to withstand the challenges of climate change. That is for the life bearing. What about the egg laying? The egg laying have device a means that they can retain the egg for up to 15 days. Now, for an organism, for a, 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 an animal to retain an egg for one day, it takes a lot because it has to feed more. The, 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 their, its movement has to reduce, and then you are exposing it to predators because when a predator is coming, the rate at which she will run fast will be reduced because she is carrying the eggs. You are reducing, you are exposing this animal to danger because of the climate. So climate change affects animals in That's various ways, in so many ways. In, uh, but to put it in summary, it affects the animals in terms of life history, when we talk about life history, that's the fecundity, that's the survival, thermoregulatory behavior. It affects the animal in number of clutch size, like I said, where it will have to reduce from 5x to 2x, or in the number of litter size, that's the number of live birds that she will have to give birth to. That's for the life history. Physiologically, you increase the burden of metabolism of this animal. And then you talk about biochemically, you talk about genetically. And in genetically, it will interest you to know that climate change affects the telomere length. When we have a hot environment, the telomere length reduces. And anybody who has the knowledge of genetics will tell you that telomere length determines your lifespan. You die as a result of the vanishing of telomere length. As you are aging, your telomere length is reducing. And that's why today we have in the field of ecology, the hypothesis we call live fast, die young. And it's as a result of climate change. Where research have shown, or is still showing, because it's species dependent, as I have said. In some species, where you have a hot environment, which is as a result of climate change, you tend to have a big, bigger offsprings because, of course, the mother will have to invest more in producing the offspring. So you have bigger offsprings that looks cute facially, but have shorter telomere length. And so they die faster than those produced in a cooler environment where they look smallish in structure, but they have a longer telomere length, so they live longer. So we, we not term it live fast, die young. Yes, you are beautiful, you have good body size, but you die fast than living the other. So 
climate change has a lot of impact on biodiversity. Now, talking about the plants, because I've been talking about animals, there are some plants that their sex is determined by the temperature of the environment. And so if you have a hotter environment, you have more of the male gametes produced. Uh, the female garment, sorry, so to say. You have more of the female produced. And then when you have more flowers with no pollen grain to fertilize, you are driving the population to be feminine biased, which is not good for population dynamics. Wow. The same thing also in animals. So if we, if I will summarize it's something we can discuss for years, but since we are time bound, I would just say that climate change affects the biodiversity negatively and fast. In the last, from 1500 to the 20s, we've lost more than 10 million species of animals alone to climate change and human activities. And based on the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, we are to lose 1 million species before the end of the mid-century, that's by 2050. If we, the stakeholders, don't take action. Interesting. You know, now someone will just ask a question that, I mean, all the things that you're saying, it, it does it does make sense. They understand all the things that you're saying. But someone somewhere doesn't understand why he should be really concerned because these are not things that we see every day when we go out. Probably you hear on the news that, hey, we don't have this anymore. We don't have this anymore. There are even certain places where we just see that uh, there are so many, there's smoke in the atmosphere, there's company emitting gases. And it's just, it's just things that this biodiversity issues impact. We don't see that every day. So why should an individual be concerned about this? Uh, okay. Yeah. You know, like you rightly say, people might not actually see the impact physically, but whether we like it or not, we are feeling the impact. And I will just link it to the ecosystem services. The ecosystem is supposed to provide food for us. The ecosystem is supposed to provide medicine, medicine from or raw materials which we will use. The ecosystem is supposed to provide beautification where we have rest of mind when we look at nature. People will just look at some flowers and they will feel at peace and relax. And say, oh, what a beautiful flower. But Let's not even talk about that because that's in the subconscious. Let's talk about the one that in the conscience now. One of the effect is in the drastic reduction in food production. And that is driving a lot of societies into hunger. Now, how many countries can boldly feed themselves now? It's because we have successfully brought ourselves to a, a one degree change that it affects our food production. And aside affecting our food production, it affects the beauty of the environment. It affects our raw materials. Let's go back to history for the sake of people who are coming from Africa and will be listening to this. In time past, a lot of people in Africa 
had a lot of medicinal resources that they just go to pick as a form of plan and just take. Now, how many of us have seen such plants of recent? They are nowhere to be found. Now, that is for people in Africa. But now let's talk about it. Let's talk to the whole world now. The antisemine or the malaria drug that is being produced, or these supplements that a lot of companies have gone into that is bringing billions of naira into the economy. A plant product. Now, if we continue with business as usual, that's the term in climate change, where we don't care, we don't change our attitude. A time will come whereby we will not have those food supplements to help support our life. A lot of people who might be listening to this are fans of the seafood. <laughs> if we successfully continue to, to, to do actions that will increase the change, because it is predicted that by the mid of century, we would have gone to four degrees change. And by the end of century, it depends on the model you use. But it is a fact that we will not be below five degrees to eight degrees increase in temperature by the end of the century. By 2100, we will not even be having the food to eat. How many of us can even survive the one degrees that we are experiencing already, where we have temperatures reaching up to 40, 42? That's under one degree change. Imagine now under eight degrees change or under four degrees. That means we'll be reaching almost boiling point. How many can survive under boiling point? Wow. So these are things that we should be very, very concerned about. For the animals that we think we don't actually care about, a lot of the clothes we are wearing for winter are made from the force of the animals. The mamas for especially and the reptiles. A lot of the shoes that we wear that is bringing multi-billion dollars. The skin uh, uh, shoes production is a source of income for a lot of people. If mm -hmm. These animals are no longer there. Which skin are we going to wear? So it is not only affecting us as food production, but even our economy is gradually shrinking. So biodiversity, it's not only, you see, Mother Nature was so generous to us to provide both the economic, the life support, and everything that we needed but we are using our hands to pull them down. Because when we continue to impact the gas emission, or when we continue to imp uh, have more of the gas emission, how many of us will be able to survive the high rate of cancer that has been happening in the last year? I will tell you this, that there are a lot of studies that have shown that some of the viral diseases that we see or that are unexplainable are as a result of the change in the environment. So some of the non-pathogenic microorganisms are becoming pathogenic now. Because when you have a bacteria or a virus that will be sterile at 10 degrees, and you are experiencing 12 degrees, that virus or bacteria will certainly become active. And when it becomes active, who is at the losing end? It is us. So we we'll have diseases around us. We we'll have our economy shrinking. We we'll have low yield production. And then we will now be 
having issues around sustenance of the ecosystem. So it is better we trace back our steps now and do things that will not jeopardize increase in climate change. I, I would like us to talk about what individuals can do to make changes. But then I, before that, I just want to um, read a report by uh, WWF mm -hmm. and uh, a certain portion of it. And uh, I would like to know your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. So according to the 2020 report, Living Planet Report 2020, page 56 and 57, it says that since the 1970, our ecological footprint has exceeded the Earth's rate of regeneration. And if you look on page 57, the activities that it is talking about that, hum that humans have exceeded the X uh, limit for regeneration, most of these activities are by companies and industries. Now I know that people in the, industry, in, in the research industry, um, you guys keep on putting the reports out there what are you doing to relate or to send this, this report to the industries who are in charge of all these things? Do they see these reports or do they have any link between the reports, I mean, the research team and the industry? Because, well, if you look at these reports, it just becomes mind blowing that we keep on doing all these things and we have research teams keeping on giving us reports. I know that these reports come in annually and all that. What is the correlation between the research and the industry? Yeah, uh, you know, David, that's an interesting question. And it goes back to say that, yeah, a lot is being done. And let to comment on that report, which you just read or you just talked about we have actually exceeded the ecological footprint because if you look at the unofficial population of the world now it's around 8 billion unofficial now what is the landmass to the population you you will imagine that the system or the earth system, the land only covers around 30%, and then the remaining is water bodies. And that 30% is where the supposed 8 billion people are to live. It's supposed where the plants that are into millions of species are also to live. It's supposed where the animals that are into millions of species are also to live. So already the ecosystem is overburdened. <laughs> and that is why there is an argument now that, okay, since the ecosystem is overburdened, should we share the land with the biodiversity or we should spare the land? People are saying already the population is on the increase and we don't see except for some countries that are doing some concerted efforts to reduce their population. But some of the countries are not even contemplating putting in measures to reduce the population. That means we keep having increase in population. So what is the reality of the biodiversity? What is the reality now of humans? Already, we are having what we call an ecosystem crisis at the moment, whereby the ecosystem can no longer hold on to and give optimally its services. And that's where you have a lot of these disease outbreaks, tsunamis, natural disasters, and uh, a lot of natural disasters happening around the world. It's as a result of the ecosystem complaining of being overburdened. So, but researchers are not resting on their oars. Recently, the 
aborted UN General Council that was supposed to uh, hold, which is being shifted for next year, where UK will be hosting at Scotland. One of the key things that will be discussed is biodiversity, where we are trying to look at heads of government who try to give their commitment to maintaining a good balance of biodiversity. And researchers are proposing, even though it's still debatable, that we should at least reserve 50% of the earth for biodiversity and occupy 50%. Now, how is that 50 going to be shared? It's still a thing of debate. <laughs> and it's what we've not gotten empirical data to actually, because we are talking about the oceans, the, which we cannot occupy. We are talking about freshwater, which we cannot occupy. And then we have animals that live on land and we are still expected to give some parts. So how is that 50% going to come up? <laughs> it's a thing of the debate. However, researchers are trying to bring out the model. That, okay, we should increase protected areas. That's sparing the land. That we should increase protected areas where we we'll have the animals or the plant species, the biodiversity living on their own. But the thing is that people are saying, or recent other groups are saying that that will reduce the tolerance level because okay, you are not used to seeing an elephant. And then an <laughs> elephant is protected or the monkey. What happens if the monkey leaves the protected area to your region? You kill it. So we are in increasing wildlife, human wildlife conflict when we protect. So we should share the land. Interesting. How efficient is the sharing of the land is a question of debate. Because how do you stop the monkey from coming to eat your farm property that you found? So how are we going to manage living together with snakes where well, you already have people that detest seeing snakes? <laughs> how are you going to live together with lions? So it's a thing of the debate. Now to come to your question on whether researchers are just researching and there is no link with industry, far from it. But as researchers, mostly researchers don't have a direct link to the industry. It is the government that makes policy to regulate the activities of industry. So what happens is that researchers submit reports to governments. Government try to look at it, make a policy out of it for the industries to abide. Now, the big question is, is the political will there to implement? Because when you are telling a private company some certain things, they will come to the table with their own side of the bargain also. Okay, if you tell me to do this, <laughs> what is my gain? Because all I want is money, profit. <laughs> I set up business for profit. So it is basically the government that was, however, there are good news that I will tell you. For instance, in the last UN General Council, where a lot of these big guys, big, big countries were made to make commitments towards reducing the burden of carbon emission. China, which is one of the largest country that emits carbon because of the fossils, a lot of industries they have that burn for made a commitment to reduce to almost zero emission by 2050. And they are doing that too by converting to clean energy. Now, US that work was that is also part of the big guys that produces a lot of carbon. We had a president who didn't believe in climate change and he 
we drew out of the Paris Agreement, the 2015 Paris Agreement. But the incoming president, that's Joe Biden, president-elect, has already made a commitment to rejoin the Paris Agreement. So that is a big relief to the world that, okay, we will have a commitment. Now, during the meetings of the head of states, every country is usually made, though it's not compulsory, but you are being convinced to make a commitment because you are being shown, okay, this is your carbon emission rate now. What are you doing to reduce the burden? Okay, give us a timeline. By 20, by mid-century, how will you have moved towards zero emission? What of the end of the century? So, and all these are credited from the researchers' output because the researchers, when they, when they research, a lot of these developed countries, they have a link with their researchers. They fund research a lot. Where we have the big problem is the third world countries, the developing countries, where there is a sharp disconnect between researchers and government. I can tell you for free even that most of these politicians might even see you as somebody who just want the money to go. But they fail to understand that from the grants researchers get, it's not for personal use. It is being channeled into the research and the data is made available. But, you know, since they don't have that understanding like the developed country, there is a disconnect. However, the developed countries are coming in to help. That's where you have some organizations like British Ecological Society in UK having special funds for ecologists in Africa. If you are an ecologist and you are from the African origin, all you just need to do is develop the idea, develop your questions, fill in the form, fill in the research grant form. And if your questions are good enough, you will be supported with 8,000 pounds to do a research. So these are some of the ways that some of the developed countries are assisting. Aside that, we have a lot of organizations that are assisting the, de the, the, the developing country researchers to do some research in their countries. So I think it's not all bad news. There is still some good news where we have the output of researchers being discussed at the highest level in the world. That's where head of states, the UN General Council, where head of states sit. And it was as a result of the discussions of researchers that we had what we call the IPCC. That's the Inter -panel, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So these are some of the credits that are given to the hard work of researchers around the globe working on how to reduce the impact of climate change on the biodiversity. I would like to say thank you so much for the insight and the things that you have uh, helped all of us to understand into details. When, when it comes to some of the activities and the action plans that we have to put in place for us to change this whole thing. I think that is something that we all generally know that there are certain things that we are doing that is increasing, that is contributing to climate change and it's affecting all of us. And I think that when we have this kind of conversations, it's not to scare people, but it's actually for people to get be aware of what is happening so that we can add our voice to advocacy and also add our voice to push our governments to um, make very good policies that can actually help to turn things around. And as we can hear right now, I believe that the researchers are doing their job as they should. 
uh, the ascendant report, but at the end, there is this gap that needs to be closed and there is this gap that needs to be, you know, fixed very well because passing the message from researchers to the industry is something that is very difficult because industries are interested in profits. How do we get the industries to, you know, start getting interested in profit and the environment? It's where the government comes in to make and set rules and policies that they have to go by in order to get their money and also protect the environment um, as well. So I think this has been a very educative section and I would like to say thank you so much. I don't know if you have any last words to say. Aside looking at the government, we as individuals, we have our small roles that we can play. For instance, if we reduce our burden on the industries, if we reduce the demand of their product, they will be forced to buy the road. But where we have a lot of us going in for cars that still emit carbon, maybe because of the cheap in price, when we have a lot of us going into deforestation, mm. where we have a lot of us still in this 21st century, not controlling the birth rate, the population, then in our own way, we are worsening the situation. Because it takes people to have a climate change and it takes people to reduce climate change. So some of the things we can do is simply, it doesn't take anything for you to, if you are going to somewhere two kilometers for you to trek or use a bicycle that emits no carbon. But we have developed attitude whereby even if we are going to where it's just 500 meters away, some people will still enter car or still ride a vehicle that emits carbon. So we have to do some certain concerted effort to reduce the climate change on our own. Aside, then we now leave the government to the burden of trying to force the companies to live in. I can tell you that in China and other big countries, there are places you cannot cite industries. And there are places that even if you cite industries, they make it clear for you that you must use a clean energy source. Dude, we still have companies that have been converted to the clean energy, still burning forces because of the cheap coal, because of the cheapness of coal. But governments are doing their best. Now we need to complement the effort of government by our own attitudes towards climate change. If not, as I have said, the ecosystem is already overburdened. The effect will still be on us. So let's take some concerted efforts to have a better society that we will have a better biodiverse ecosystem and then we will be served better by the ecosystem because the ecosystem is for us yeah yeah wow beautiful so thank you so much for coming uh today gideon i really 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 appreciate the time that i had with you and i hope that we can have you another time to discuss other areas of um, the ecology and uh, biodiversity and thank you so 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 much for your time thank you for having me it's always a pleasure to share my thoughts on some certain issues. So in a nutshell, the take home message today is climate change is real. It's happening. Uh, whether we are impacting it or it's impacting us, there is climate change at the end. And uh, to turn the story around, it's not just left to industries alone and the government alone. As individuals, we should also try and see the products that we go in for. It doesn't just stick to cars, even the food that we go in for. 
because you should just know that do you know the amount of water that goes into just making one hamburger resources that go into the clothes that we have to make textile uh, things so let's support local shops let's support local markets instead of going to the big supermarkets that are heaped with plastics and and all that let's also show the industries that we actually want to go back to the small things that we need provide us the things that we need not more than what we need so you as a consumer when you're going in for something you should also check it out whether you really need it or it's necessary for you to get it and where it's coming from look into it because it's value for money So that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for joining us. See you on the next episode. Until then, live green.